Next, on Weapons at War. The blast from these huge weapons is earth-shattering. The explosive force of their shells can be devastating. Rail guns, coastal batteries, and massive naval guns. On land or at sea, these mighty weapons blast a path to victory. They're the big guns. Next, on Weapons at War. big guns is unquestionable. Due to the importance of mobility on the modern battlefield, many of today's guns are smaller than their predecessors. The guns of the coast artillery were consistently some of the largest and most powerful, firing shells up to 16 inches in diameter which weighed almost a ton. Long ranges and heavy penetrating shells were needed to counter thickly armored warships. The function of coastal artillery was to protect the shores of the nation from enemy navies. Obviously, as naval artillery became more capable, coast artillery had to follow. And the typical coast artillery designs used naval rifle barrels. The U.S. used a number of 14, 15, and ultimately 16-inch coastal batteries. One such battery was located at Fort MacArthur, perched on a hill overlooking the Pacific Ocean and protecting the Los Angeles Harbor since 1914. The upper part of the base was home to two 14-inch guns, known as Battery Osgood and Battery Farley. Today, Fort MacArthur is a quiet military museum. As an army installation, it has long been obsolete, stripped of the huge cannons which sent shells hurtling out to sea. But during World War II, hundreds of men were stationed here, including two young army soldiers named Robert Hogarth and Hazen White. I came here from Fort Rosecrans down in San Diego, and I got here just in time to uh... Uh, get in on the firing of these 14-inch uh, disappearing carriage guns, which was quite a thrill. As I understand, this was the last time these 14-inch guns were fired. The main reason, of course, was that it did so much damage around the town with the windows and everything, you know, and scared old people. They fired five or six rounds, and uh, they were very accurate. Uh, it sounded like uh, the earth was <laughs> coming to an end. Everyone had either earplugs or held their ears. You had to because, well, it broke thousands of windows around town. The concussion was so severe, the crew would use an old gunner's trick of standing on their toes and opening their mouths during firing. The idea there being if you open your mouth, you equalize the pressure on the inside as, uh, as with the atmospheric pressure on the outside, and your ear of drum can fluctuate accordingly. Each gun in its carriage weighed 70 tons and could launch a 1,560-pound shell to a range of 17 miles. Batteries Osgood and Farley were known as disappearing guns, a common and ingenious design for coastal cannons. The principle, of course, is when the gun is firing, it's, it could be seen from the ocean through a telescope from a ship. But once it's fired, it disappears back down below the parapet and it cannot be seen. 
and the action of that cannon when it comes back down is just comes down smooth. Of course, they lock it as soon as it hits down, and then they load it. Robert Hogarth was stationed on the lower reservation at Fort MacArthur, home to the two 14-inch railway guns of Battery Irwin. I came to Fort MacArthur on December the 10th, 1941, as a private. I was stationed on the railroad guns, and we had the opportunity to fire the, same, the guns. We had two guns, one for each gun fired seven rounds, and we did considerable damage to the city of San Pedro, where uh, in glass damage alone, it was, they say $50,000 worth of glass damage. The concussion was just terrific. It tore all the siding off the barrack. We started to blow down the motor pool, which was corrugated steel. We blew that down completely by the time we'd fired our seventh round. Our la the seventh round actually blew the porch off of the uh, induction barracks across the, the way. The gun would fire 26 miles. Uh, we didn't want to hit Catalina. We could, but we didn't want to hit Catalina. These batteries were completely self-sufficient. A generator protected by thick concrete walls and a metal door provided power. Underground tunnels meant that the soldiers could move without exposing themselves to enemy fire. And tubes, known as chutes, allowed the men to communicate with each other quickly from anywhere in the battery. However, by the time World War II began, communication was carried out using microphones and headsets. When the guns of Battery Osgood and Battery Farley were built between 1916 and 1919, they could equal or outrange any battleship guns. But by the 1940s, enemy ships could fire up to six miles farther. Still, the guns were manned and everyone on the West Coast, including entertainers, was caught up in the wartime frenzy. In addition to railway and disappearing guns, many coastal batteries used high-angled artillery, known as mortars. The development of high angle of fire weapons, such as mortars, was considered useful because a mortar dropping its shell from high angles would be more likely to penetrate the thinly armored decks of a ship rather than the side armor, which is what the naval rifles would tend to hit when they were fired directly at a target. But battleship guns continued to improve. They could also fire at high angles, rendering the 20-foot thick walls in front of most batteries completely useless. However, more than any other factor, it was the airplane which led to the downfall of coastal installations. The problem with coastal artillery, of course, is that as long as the enemy had to come ashore with naval ships, the artillery was fine. But as soon as the aircraft carrier was developed, Coastal artillery became fixed gun emplacements that could be bypassed. Still, many coastal batteries saw action in World War II. Probably the largest system of these defenses was the Atlantic Wall, constructed along hundreds of miles of French-occupied coastline under the close supervision of Erwin Rommel and other high-ranking German leaders. The front gate of Fortress Europe was bristling with huge, long-range guns protected by thick concrete walls. Yet for all of its intimidating size, the Atlantic Wall was still a perfect illustration of the problem with large, fixed gun emplacements in the age of the airplane. Allied bombers pounded the concrete and steel turrets from above. As the Armada approached, 16-inch battleship guns and rockets bombarded the coast. Once the battle was over, it was clear that the mighty Atlantic Wall, as all coastal concrete gun emplacements, was doomed to extinction. One of the first shots fired in World War I came from the monstrous Krupp's 42-centimeter gun, also known as Big Bertha. At the time, it was the largest artillery piece in the world. 
This was an extremely large, very heavily built, short-barreled howitzer capable of throwing a shell of more than one ton, several thousand yards. It was a short, stubby thing. It's been likened to a, a beer bottle on a, on a pair of wheels. But basically, it fired a very large and heavy shell packed with explosive in such a way that it would plunge down onto fortifications and literally drive its way into the fortification before it actually exploded. And I say drive down into it, sometimes as many as 30, 40, 50 feet before the shell would explode. Without the use of the Big Bertha, those forts would have held up the German army for quite some weeks, if not months. As it was, they were able to smash them their way through in a matter of days, making possible a big sweep through Belgium and into northern France. However, the movement which had occurred in the early stages of the war soon came to an end. French and English forces were able to stop the German advance. Both sides began to prepare defensive positions with machine guns positioned along the front lines and an incredible array of artillery guns just a few hundred yards behind. Artillery was the king of battle in World War I. 70% of the casualties were caused directly or indirectly by artillery fire. There were huge siege mortars, howitzers, long guns of virtually every description, size, shape, range, some throwing shells weighing only a few pounds and others throwing shells weighing tons. The massive use of artillery in pre-invasion barrages, often lasting days, churned up the battlefield into the famous moonscape that we know as no man's land on the Western Front, where virtually nothing could travel. World War I truly was the artilleryman's war. And for the young soldiers heading to the front for the first time, the sights and sounds of the big guns offered them a final romantic vision of war. We could see the flashes first on the horizon and to realize that that was where this great war was going on. And we were going to it. We were soon going to be up there, and we couldn't wait to hear the sound of the gunfire. And when we heard it, it just sent thrills all through us. It just, it was really, we really knew that we were there. Because of the stalemate, both armies used the vast rail networks in Western Europe to bring their heaviest guns to the front. The advantage of the railroad gun is that it allows a much larger barrel and thus a much larger projectile to be fired than was possible with any of the field artillery of the period. Mode of transport was very poor in World War I. The trucks and tractors were underpowered, relatively unreliable, and because of the very heavy loads, horse transport was really not practical. The rail guns of the First World War appeared in many shapes and sizes, but their purpose was always the same, to reach deep behind enemy lines in order to bombard supply areas and headquarters. Each gun required many soldiers to get it in place and prepared for firing. But once the shell was away, the result was incredible. One time, the Navy brought in the big 16-inch railroad guns on railroad cars. And wow, never saw or heard anything like that. We all had to plug our ears, and if it got behind the gun, you could see the shell as they left the barrel. Watch it, watch it go. So it was quite a thrill to see that. These guns were so few and far between, they, began, they, they all gradually acquired names. The, uh, the Germans had what they, they, they called the Bruno series. And there was the Langer Bruno, the Long Bruno, the Schwere Bruno, the Heavy Bruno. The guns were so few and far between, they became almost like ships. And the crews that traveled with those guns and became part of the, the guns, the gun itself, virtually. However, the Germans built one long-range gun that could outdistance any of the rail guns. 
It was known as the Paris gun, and it had an amazing range of over 70 miles. The basis of the Paris gun was a 15-inch naval rifle barrel that was bored out to accept a smaller 240 millimeter gun barrel, which was fitted into the first barrel like a liner. This extended approximately 36 feet beyond the original gun barrel. The shells from the Paris gun actually passed out of the atmosphere into the upper reaches of the stratosphere, approximately 24 miles high. As a result, they gained in velocity as they fell through the thin air, and only when they reached the lower atmosphere did they slow down to 2,000 miles an hour. When the first shells landed, the Parisians thought they were being bombed by German aircraft, and they wondered why the air raid alarms had not been sounded. But rather quickly, the French realized they were being bombarded by an artillery piece. The problem with the Paris gun was that it was not accurate enough at a range of 65 or 70 miles to pick out individual military targets. For this reason, once it had performed its mission of upsetting Parisian citizens, it really lost some of its military effectiveness. In fact, one of the most valuable guns of the entire war was the rather small 75 millimeter Puteau model. This French artillery piece had an advanced recoil system, which allowed a very rapid rate of fire without moving the gun off its target. Easy to move, quick to fire, and deadly accurate, the French 75 proved to be the most effective gun of World War I. As World War II began, it seemed that Germany had learned from its mistakes in the Great War. Instead of relying solely on a few heavy super guns, the German army also seemed well prepared for modern mobile warfare. Mechanized vehicles towed a variety of versatile field guns designed to keep pace with the armored units of the Blitzkrieg. It was a magnificent parade spectacle in the middle 1930s, but the vehicles, the guns, the equipment were all too complicated and too expensive for German industry to build in sufficient numbers to supply the needs of the German army. Still, the Panzer units were able to overpower all of their early opponents. Heavy artillery fire was brought down on the enemy once they were outflanked. Even the mighty Maginot line fell as the Blitzkrieg swept past, allowing the German rear units to slowly chip away at the huge concrete and steel gun turrets. The impenetrable fortress now seemed like an aging fighter, too slow to mount an attack and incapable of avoiding the punishing blows being hurled its way. But even as Hitler celebrated one of his greatest triumphs, the air of German invincibility was already fading. The German army was not really ready to go to war in 1939, and they never entirely caught up. Their production schedules were never ambitious enough to supply their army with all of the weapons they needed. The German factories were not producing enough vehicles and mobile guns, but slow production was not the only problem. Prodded by their leader, German engineers were once again spending incredible amounts of time and energy developing super weapons. German engineers are very good engineers, but I think they like to build monuments, and I think Hitler encouraged them to build monuments. And they like to build big, massive, awesome things. And they did it, and they built good artillery. They built this massive artillery. However, as far as effectiveness, the Americans built good mobile artillery in high volume, and it was much more effective than these few big railroad guns they had. By far the best example of Hitler's infatuation with the ultimate cannon was Schwer Gustav, still today the heaviest gun ever built. Originally designed to crush the Maginot Line, the 1,329-ton Gustav was not ready for action until it was sent to the Eastern Front in 1942. It was the biggest gun of all time, and that's the sole reason why it was built. It was a Wagnerian obsession by Hitler and the Nazi regime to have something that was bigger, that would really be absolutely the greatest gun of all time. And it was a whopper. The thing, the shells were, 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 were taller than a man. The caliber, the actual width of the barrel was 
800 millimeters. It, it was an extraordinary gun, but in military terms, it was, it was laughable. It took thousands of men to prepare the area for the arrival of the gun. The Dora, or Schwerer Gustav, was so large that it required a double railroad track of special construction. The weapon was as high as a three-story house, required 350 men to fire. The weapon was erected and in 1942 was fired 48 times during the siege of Sevastopol. The destruction caused by the weapon was absolutely incredible. Uh, newsreel shots of the shells exploding made the city look like a city of small toy buildings. It was very, very effective, but the actual manpower resources of getting that gun across Europe and actually getting it into action and firing it was such that it actually diverted manpower away from the main attack. I always like to think that gun helped the Allies win the Second World War in its own quiet way. Gustav was not the only huge gun used at Sevastopol. The Germans employed a variety of heavy guns, including the 600 millimeter cannon known as Thor. The Thor was a self-propelled heavy mortar, uh, 60 centimeter, with a huge counterweight block around the breech, one of its distinguishing characteristics. It was normally transported by rail and then by special trailers and was usually driven on its self-propelled tracks only in the immediate vicinity of its firing position. But again, although it was very large and individually quite effective, it required a fair number of people to operate and probably was not a practical weapon. Self-propelled guns began to replace rail guns during World War II due to their increased mobility and their ability to avoid aerial attack. The European landscape provided enough open country to make the use of self-propelled guns effective, and the Germans had several capable models. Yet two railgun designs were still able to distinguish themselves. The 21-centimeter K-12E had a range of over 70 miles and was equipped with a brace on the barrel similar to the Paris gun of World War I. The other model's official designation was the K-5E. However, it was much more widely known by its nickname, Anzio Annie. The most famous use of this weapon was against the Anzio beachhead in 1944 when two of these guns became known as Anzio Annie or the Anzio Express. The K5E was one of the most accurate railroad guns ever built. The British swore that the Germans could hit a single truck with it. The American use of artillery in World War II demonstrated that the age of the mammoth guns was quickly fading. Initially, the U.S. Army was ill-prepared, forcing recruits to practice with World War I vintage guns. But once the nation kick-started its wartime economy, America soon became the world leader in modern artillery. In less than two and a half years, we had completely developed a 105 howitzer which could be towed or self-propelled on, on an M7 tank carriage. We developed a new 155 howitzer which could be towed. We had a 155 Long Tom, which was a higher velocity gun, which was, which was a towed vehicle, towed by a truck. And then we had the 8-inch howitzer, which was also a towed artillery piece, and the 8-inch gun, which was also towed, and the 240 millimeter howitzer, which was towed. And this was the most modern up to the artillery in the world. The Germans, the Russians, nobody had artillery was that modern, that mobile that we had. The self-propelled guns were built on half-track and light and medium tank chassis. They were enormously successful, very mobile, and we could build them by the thousands. With armor, you have great mobility. You can go anywhere. You can be going down the road and get a fire mission, pull off in a matter of a few minutes. They're very fast and uh, mobile and 
we could fire from one spot, move to another spot, and uh, keep it up. Individually, the American guns were not nearly as powerful as Thor or Gustav. But taken as a whole, the U.S. Army quickly realized that the mobility of their smaller artillery pieces allowed them to bring an incredible amount of fire to bear on the critical points of the battlefield. One of the best innovations was this ability to mass fires. As we got into World War II and had better responsiveness, then we were able to mass anywhere from uh, 20 to 25, maybe even t greater number of battalions than that. The Germans did not have the, the flexibility that we had to mass the fires. Simple design was also an important ingredient to the American success. One of the characteristics of the Germans, they build excellent machines. Uh, for example, the German 105 howitzer. Uh, same gun, same range, and everything is ours, except the, the block on our house would have, say, maybe seven parts. They may have 45 in the same to do the same thing. So as a result, our equipment was much easier to maintain because the German equipment was so complex. It was a machine designer's dream. It was beautifully designed, but as far as being effective to maintain, it, it wasn't as good as ours. However, there were two notable exceptions in artillery design during World War II. The German Army produced an 88-millimeter model which was versatile, mobile, and available in large enough numbers to be quite effective. Probably the best piece of German artillery of the entire war was the 88-millimeter gun. For once, the Germans followed their best military instincts and developed an excellent dual-purpose weapon. The 88-millimeter gun was not only a fine anti-aircraft gun, fully effective against bomber forces right through the war. But it also evolved into one of the best anti-tank guns of World War II. At the same time, the American Army broke with typical procedure and produced a super gun of its own. Known as Little David, this 914 millimeter mortar is still the largest gun ever built in terms of barrel diameter. Little David was designed to penetrate Japanese mainland fortifications with its nearly two-ton shell. It was test fired in April of 1945, but because of the development of the atomic bomb, the invasion was canceled and Little David never saw action. However, the damage caused by this huge gun was still amazing. The average crater was 38 feet wide and over 20 feet deep. The first atomic cannon was a 280 millimeter gun known as Atomic Annie. This 75 ton cannon could be transported on roads using specially designed twin motor cabs. It was got the name Atomic Annie because it was specifically de uh, devised to, to fire a two atomic projectile. But it was only a large conventional gun. It was, it was unusual in design in that it had a, a, um, a twin tractor unit. But the main difference, was, as far as the gun was concerned, it fired an atomic projectile. It was just an oversized gun. So the concept of the atomic gun is no great departure from conventional artillery. That shell could, could easily be developed and could be delivered by a, a rocket. It could be delivered by an aircraft. Where the gun, the atomic gun, or atomic cannon, call it what you will, scores over those methods, is that you can keep on delivering them accurately at any time of the day or night, under any circumstances. Technological development has always been vitally linked to the big guns. Slow communications did not allow the soldiers of World War I to use the big guns as efficiently as they had hoped to. In the later wars, where you could call back by radio, not that, 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 that telegraph or hand signal. You could talk to the battery 
Commander A, about 200 yards to the right, and you're about 150 over. He can correct it and put a shell right in your lap. That's good. <laughs> we love the guys. <laughs> However, while some forms of technology were helping to improve the big guns, other advances began to change their role entirely. Rockets began to emerge as viable weapons during World War II, providing an increased volume of fire and longer ranges than conventional artillery. They were relatively inherently inaccurate. Now, this inaccuracy was made up for by letting them off in vast numbers all at once. We came to the Stalin organs, the Katyushas, the German naval Werfer. People began to find that this was sometimes far more effective than having well-aimed single rounds from an artillery piece landing on the same target. You could actually saturate a whole area. Nothing could move in that area. Any tar military target would be obliterated. So the rocket came into its own and it's remained a viable artillery weapon ever since. Besides saturation, rockets also offered a long-range alternative to the big guns. You then saw the development of missiles by the German into a, into a next generation type missile similar to the V-1 and the V-2 missiles. The V-1, or the buzz bomb, was merely a pilotless rocket airplane. It fired, uh, sending the vehicle into the air. The wings were able to maneuver it. The gyro uh, system compass that it had enabled a, a primitive tracking system that allowed it to, to navigate uh, across the channel and hit England. Uh, this was improved then with the V-2 missile that was uh, supersonic and was unable to be shot down by the British Spitfires and the Hurricanes and was, uh, was such an effective terror weapon that many thought that it would uh, tip the scales of World War II. But the development of this technology was the beginnings of a missile system that the United States and the Soviet Union further developed in the years past World War II into the nuclear-tipped missiles of the 1960s, 70s, 80s, and 90s. In addition to long-range strategic missiles, area fire weapons such as the U.S. Army's MLRS and TACOMS systems are still in use today. The 30-kilometer range of the multiple launch rocket system means that it is often called upon to accomplish the same tasks once reserved for the larger rail guns. This system fires a full bay of missiles at a target, or one missile at a time, depending on what the target is, at a great range, greater a range, 30 kilometers, than normal artillery can fire. So it gives the artillery commander and the maneuver commander on the battlefield the ability to reach out far and apply a great amount of force in a very small amount of time at an enemy formation. Yet even as advances in rocket and guided missile technology were being made, there was still a strong need for conventional artillery firepower. In Vietnam, artillery fire support bases were constructed throughout the jungle, providing vital support for soldiers in the field. We had artillery and, and fire support bases. This was a great perimeter berm. It might be a few hundred yards across, or it might be a half a mile. It might have one artillery battery of four guns, or two or three, or a whole battalion, or maybe two battalions in there. And you could interlock the fires between one fire support base, another fire support base, and mass them out there, not only to support infantry operations, but to help defend other fire support bases, and also to help defend the villages of the Vietnamese. In 1968, when the compound at Khe San was under attack from tens of thousands of North Vietnamese, the batteries at Camp Carroll, 17 miles away, helped keep enemy forces at bay until reinforcements arrived. Vietnam served to illustrate that while the guns of the artillery may not be as big as some of their predecessors, their role is still vitally important. On the modern battlefield, mobility and fast, accurate fire are essential to victory. Go,
The M109A6 Paladin is a perfect example of the modern big gun. Mobile, lethal, and smart. The major advantage of a modern fire control system like the Paladin is that the vehicle is equipped with a global positioning system, or GPS. It allows the crew to know exactly where it is at all times. They can fire as soon as the vehicle stops get rid of a few rounds, and then before the enemy can find their firing location and return fire, they simply pick up, move on a few more hundred yards down the road, and set up and keep firing. If you can go through this, this cycle faster, if you can find your location, determine the uh, target location, transmit the ballistic information to the gun, the correct azimuth, the correct elevation, all of that faster, and do all that without an external fire direction center, you have a weapon system of great power. The next generation of guns currently under development will have even more capabilities. One example is the 155 millimeter Defender, which will eventually be a self-propelled howitzer. The Defender system fires projectiles using a liquid propellant instead of gunpowder. Rather than a gunner pushing a, a shell up, this, up the, into the chamber and adding a propelling charge, he'll put the shell in only, probably by some sort of automated means, and then an automatic system will inject a certain amount of liquid propellant in an aerosol form, possibly, into a chamber, ignite it, and off goes a shell in the conventional fashion. The liquid propellant gun, because it burns very cleanly and fires very fast, if it's tied to an automatic loader, can therefore put several rounds in the air at one time. And this allows one cannon to be able to do what a battery of artillery would normally do today. Another advantage of liquid propellants is decreased muzzle flash. Older guns would create a huge fireball as the shell left the barrel because the gunpowder would not completely burn away inside the chamber. But liquid propellants are fully combusted inside the firing chamber, almost eliminating muzzle flash and making the gun less vulnerable to counterattack. There are also many improvements being made to the shells themselves. The copperhead is a cannon-launched laser-guided projectile that flies through the air and seeks a laser beam. A coated laser beam is held and fired by either a ground station or an air station. The copperhead has fins, and the fins guide it as it flies through the air. It gives artillery the ability to be very accurate, pinpoint accurate. It is, in effect, a smart artillery shell. Other munitions will actually seek and destroy enemy targets on their own. In a sad arm uh, munitions, the cannon will launch a projectile which at a certain uh, elevation above the target will explode and will allow submunitions to come out. And these submunitions then filter to the ground through various means, some by parachute, others by other different arrangements. With different sensors inside the submunition, it seeks the top of the armored vehicle points in the correct direction to fire at that armored vehicle and then launches a submunition of its own. This submunition then fires at the top of the vehicle where it is most vulnerable. All of these improvements allow the artillery to bring an incredible amount of fire to bear on very specific targets using fewer guns than ever before. Today, we have an ability to disperse our artillery. The more that you can disperse your artillery, yet still mass its effects, the greater power your artillery has. Dispersed artillery that can fire from many different locations allow the commander an ability to impact that battle with tremendous force at a decisive point. It also allows that artillery to survive. It makes it more difficult to kill that artillery through counter-battery fire. Despite the efficiency of mobile quick-firing artillery, there are some leaders who still feel that the ultimate super cannon is the solution. The Canadian artillery expert, Dr. Gerald Bull, dreamt of using cannons to project satellites into space. 
Several extremely large test guns were built, but none of the trials were successful. Then in 1989, huge metal barrel sections constructed to bold specifications were manufactured in England and sent to Iraq under the guise of petrochemical pipes. A 350 millimeter prototype was built and fired successfully. This was a great stride towards the completion of a 1,000 millimeter super gun almost 200 yards long, which Saddam Hussein could use to shell Israel. It was to be built on the side of a hill at a 45 degree angle nestled deep in the mountains of northern Iraq and protected by anti-aircraft batteries. But British and Greek customs were finally alerted to the pipe's true purpose and the final shipments were seized. The problem with these systems is that they're all fixed sites. And of course, anything that's a fixed site can be identified, located, and then of course take it out by your adversaries. So there are advantages and disadvantages to a super gun system. Uh, the te technology that was involved in developing the super gun, though, is very interesting to study and will have application uh, in uh, artillery in the future. Modern coast defenses have turned to long range missiles instead of larger conventional cannons to protect nations from enemy navies. The typical defense against enemy naval forces right now is the shore-based anti-shipping missile. This is a weapons family that enables even a third world country, such as Iraq, to mount an effective defense against foreign naval vessels. An Iraqi pilot fired an Exocet missile, which heavily damaged the uh, destroyer USS Stark. So the anti-shipping missile launched from low-flying aircraft has extended the range of the old coastal defense artillery battery and has brought the defense of the coastline from naval forces out into deep water. Warships are also making much greater use of missiles. The Tomahawk missile with a maximum range of over 800 miles reaches much deeper into enemy territory than the battleship's 16-inch guns. Flying low to the ground, the Tomahawk is difficult to destroy with countermeasures and is incredibly accurate. However, when there are suitable targets for the battleship's big guns to fire at, they can still be remarkably effective. The Gulf War demonstrated that even though the guns themselves have changed little over the past 50 years, their impact on the battlefield and the very sight of their firing is simply awesome.